Bermuda was originally uninhabited until it was discovered in 1609 due to a shipwreck of the Sea Venture. Many Pequots that were captured during the Pequot Massacre and following wars were sent to Bermuda as slaves and they were placed on an island called St. David's. This is a fact that is backed by the records and shipping log of a Captain White of Summers Island, whom purchased 80 Pequot families to serve as slaves on his estate. St. David's is an island that was isolated from the mainland. There was no means of escape. These people lived in isolation for many decades, centuries even. All of the inhabitants, no matter what their tribal affiliation, were called Mohawks. It was a dirty nickname for the St. David's Islanders given to them by uneducated Bermudians. After many generations of being called Mohawk, many became convinced that they were Mohawk, despite the fact that a man named Jacob Minor, who is an ancestor to most of the St. David's Islanders told the Bermudian courts in the 1700s that he was a Pequot, and that he was captured while fishing in the Long Island Sound. Over the years and after settling into a pattern of a new lifestyle, Manny began to carve a life out of this island, and now home that they had inherited many miles from their homeland. This is a documentary on the reconnection of the descendants of the Pequots that was sent to Bermuda and the current Pequots of today. ago this area including all these houses that that are here uh, was covered by cedar trees and other vegetation earlier I showed you a picture of it and you can see at the bottom of the picture all these cedar trees and uh, what the Alvarez did over a hundred years ago or more they cut a pathway into the center of these cedar trees and other vegetation and then in the center they cut another opening area and in that area once it was cut out it was still dark because of the vegetation was so thick thus the name dark bottom and once they cut out the center part the elders used to light a fire and dance and sing around this fire in a foreign language uh, the language has uh, has been lost over the years but St. David's Island still use few words here and there that are different from the rest of the rest of the island. Now whenever we have a, a powwow here, our relatives from the states drop their bags and they come right here. And we say prayers and we give blessings to our ancestors who have passed on many years, those who have sacrificed their lives, what have you. And then once we have that ceremony, it may last an hour, sometimes it gets very emotional and then they go to their respective homes and relax, but it's not done until we, we get here. In later years, they used this area for picnic, picnic grounds or playgrounds for children and what have you, but we have asked government not to build on this and to keep it for us. And so far, so good. There's a sign at the entrance where you see the sign, Dark Bottom uh, Playground, it's owned by the Bermuda government. But uh, we treasure this every time we have a, a uh, social, we plant a cedar tree a, in memory of the occasion as well as our ancestors. Tell me about the dark bottom ceremony. Well, it's every other year that we have the great reconnection that has been going on now for several years. That when our relatives from overseas visit us, whether it's from one tribe or several tribes, we all gather there to partake in acknowledging one's presence and, and also acknowledging those who have passed on uh, with the fire burning, with, uh, which is something to which we hold dear amongst ourselves. And what's the significance of the dark bottom? Why that location specifically? It is said by our 
elders that this is where they often gather during the summer uh, once they, well, let's say, finish their day's work. And this was somewhere to which I believe that the Europeans were not so much encouraged to be amongst the people. It's something that was chosen and observed over the period of centuries we've been here. So that's even before the reconnection took time. Yes, but in a rather guarded way, not as publicly known as it is today. Uh, of course, today it's publicly known thanks to the, uh, the big reconnection that took place. And now we can share with them that even though it is taken place, it is something done. It. It's not done in secret. One is encouraged to observe uh, and also partake, but no picture taking. Most of them remember uh, the elves singing and dancing in this foreign language. But I know when St. David's elves get together, certain words are said, and other people say, what, what are they talking about? You know, well, don't worry, we know what they're talking about. Yeah. And particularly if they get excited, they start chopping words about ch chopping words up and mm. using different words. And, mm -hmm. But St. David's elves know what they're saying. I understand we're at Fort St. Catholic. Um, beach here where yeah, this, at the background here is Fort St. Catharines uh, Beach as well as the old fort. Many years ago, in, like I said, 1609, the Sea Venture sunk, it was shipwrecked out here, and the passengers, the 140 men and 10 women, came ashore here and, in essence, started the colonization of Bermuda. Behind me is stockades that were used by the colonists to whip slaves and humiliate them. In the background here, there is a, a replica of the deliverance. This was the, uh, it, it's to the inch. It's built on land with a concrete base. It's made of wood. And that was the ship that brought the first colonialist to the Inside, it's not open to the public at the moment, but inside you have the slave quarters and all that sort of stuff. And um, the conditions, like I said earlier, are not the best, or we're not the best. On the church property just below the steps on the left there, for many, many years there was a plaque and it gave the history of the, this church and the date and uh, when it was built, etc. And also included the fact that not only blacks were buried up here, but Native Americans, Americans from the Caribbean and South America were also buried here. Well, the new priest and his wisdom, or lack of it, decided to take the plaque down and refused to put it back up. And uh, when questioned, he said, this is my church, I do as I like. So we had no recourse. And now they've put this here, uh, sign here, but it doesn't indicate that directly that Native Americans were buried here, but Native Americans were buried here. Tell me about what do you think that kept the St. Davis Island people so close and connected? Because, because everybody knows everybody. Right, knows. because of that island, see, you know, where they can get off that island until they had their bridge built. Oh, they built the bridge. That bridge was built, I think, 1930. And, uh, that's how they kept together. He used to swim. You bathe. You go to the island. Oh, it's good. And it's no tide. And I go in like, like, like 10, 15 minutes. I don't get back. Because I, 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 I was a good swimmer that day. From St. Davis. Yeah, from St. Davis. But they were Indians. The Indian descent. Mm hmm. Yeah. How do you know? Yeah. How do you know the Indian descent? Well, we did because you know, we looked them up and all like that. You looked them up and you knew. Yeah. And, uh, and the people in St. Davis knew who the Indians were. Yeah. What about the millets, Mom? The millets, yeah. The millets were Indians? The millets lived right up next to us. 
And if everybody's related on St. David's Island, wouldn't they have Indian blood too? Blessing. I like your um my tell wampum. me about that. Who where did you get that? Well my good friend Anawan Reed, he gave me this oh, right. here as a gift towards my uh my higher learnings towards the Eastern War Dance and doing well in it. So he'll donate some to my regalia. Very nice. Well, I mean, just to be in this regalia is an honor. Mother being made this and it's just an honor because like I said before, we are survivors, so it's like, for me to be my cultural dress, it means a lot to me, because it means that, hey, I'm alive, we survived, you know, we're still here. It's about my heritage, and yet I brought him back over 3,000 miles. <laughs> yeah. I just, I said, I want that. All the other seminars I picked out, sitting bull, I said, that's sitting bull. Sitting bull. And that's something. <laughs> You know, the hard part about with the Bermudian natives is, you know, trying to link them to what tribe. We know we all look alike, but to try to track down like who belongs to Narragansett, Wampanoag, uh, Pequot, you know, what fractions. That's, I think that's what's going to be challenging. You know, Sometimes when I'm here, I just double take. I was thinking I've seen a cousin. I'm ready to call out to him and say, hey, so no, no, that's not that. A lot of similar very, very similar in the features. But not even just features. I mean, features is one thing. But even the way how we interact and how warm we feel, which is a great thing. So, well, there's a lot of families that, at Bermuda, it's not just Pequot. No. Connection. No. There's other connections. There's other connections as well. Like, I knew a few people that said the Cherokee, Micmac, uh, then my aunt, who's married to my uncle, she's a Shinnecock, you know, and she met my uncle. Yeah. There's a lot of other, other tribes, but what our community tries to do is bring them all together. Um, you know, when grandmother opens her mouth, basically that's the end of this discussion. It's very similar to here. Um, you know, you don't behave poorly or badly around elders the same way up here. So it's pretty well much, much a difference. We start with the Grand Nation. We help with the rest of the islands understand what we're learning. So we, we don't know everything or understand all of these things that we have learned. It shouldn't be like sharing. Traits, I would say, would have probably be the, the craftsmanship, like arts and crafts. I saw that in the village that they had a uh, how they made nets, fish nets, for like fish nets. And it's pretty much the same knot that they use in St. David. You tie the rope, right? You tie the rope? Yeah. So you have some cords, rope cords going, cordage. Turn it. And then it it turns and ties. So you have a long rope. This looks like cedar wood, huh? So then it turns and turns and turns. Just like I did on your finger. Yes. And it turns. And they did this a lot on the boats to keep the rope. So you could start here and, and, and create a rope going way down yeah. there with this. Had about three strands. Yeah. And they, 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 three strands through these. They had it on pullets to tie that yeah. and yep. then you bring that along. And then and it that goes one. all the way. Yeah. Wonderful. I like that. You know the strangest thing, personally, I always felt kind of 
connected to? It was um, Hayward. Um, Joyce. Joyce. Yeah. And then when I met her mother, it was like, uh, oh my gosh, this has got to be my family. <laughs> she, she was like, I looked at this woman so the night we went to the hotel, you know, and I got talking to her. Yeah, and I said, she is my family. We went to Bermuda uh, for the festival, for their powwow over there, and that was my first time, and it reminded me of our old ways. Just the way it used to be in Mashpee, just the way it was here at Pequot Land. Uh, we're the same people, we're all Algonquin. Yes. And it was like being at home with all, all your people. Everyone looked alike, it felt like it was at home, and uh, I can't wait to go back. Similarities in the people themselves. I mean, we see people down there that could swear they were brothers and sisters to the people up here. It's, it's so amazing. And the manner, mannerism yeah. as well, and the geniality, the, uh, the family, yeah. connection with people feeling so close to one another that uh, you feel as though you've known them for a long, long time. It's not a like trait. Yes, it's not like a just, Native American We didn't trait. just right. meet them. We knew yes. them from in here, right. you know, so it's very good. So to have that exchange for them to come here and stay in our homes, and when we go over there, we stay in their homes. So it's very good. Um, one of the most positive experiences uh, was pretty spiritual one when they had the the wreath, um, they put the wreath in the water with the uh, flowers on it, and I guess the flowers symbolized lost loved ones. Um, and to think of obviously all the ones that were lost over the hundreds of years that they've been down there waiting to be found, uh, those that were lost on the ships, the slave ships heading there, you know. Some people were just dumped off as cargo, as you may know. Um, just thinking of all those people, you know, it really took my heart away as, that, as the tide took that wreath away. You know, it was like really, really powerful spiritual experience. So that's what really summed up to me the importance of why we go there and, you know, how, how much of an honor it is. What, what I found on our first reconnection, when we had the libation, mm -hmm. you know, for the mm -hmm. families and stuff, that was the most moving part. I mean, I, oh, yeah. I from the time oh, I walked yeah. over to Red Hill, tears were just streaming down my yeah. eyes. Everybody. Everybody. I looked around and like, and, and nobody said anything. Nobody yeah. said, but everybody can feel the spirit. In fact, um, Dredd and Baha, who did the, the camera work, yeah. they said they captured on there a face of an I Indian have head. I have right? That. Mm -hmm. And they said it had to be, they had to it, um, break the camera down, really to focus, to focus it down so you could see it. Mm -hmm. And that's when we had put the, um, the libations into the water. The reefs, said, yeah. the reefs and stuff. So when they saw that, they, he said he saw like a spirit of a, of a Native American Indian. Just a feeling, just a spirit. It was just, it's not, it's, it's the spirit. It's like if you was in church and they talk about the Holy Ghost, it's not something you can read. It's the same thing when you went when we went there, and it's, we still got it today. It's a feeling. It's it's a it's a spirit. You know, it's just the spirit there is good. It's like you go to a powwow. Some spirits are it's like a good spirit sometimes, and sometimes it's not. You know, uh, it just was the spirit of the powwow. It was the spirit of the social. It was the spirit of the people. You know, it was the spirit of the universe at that time, that weekend. It was just it was great. Once we reconnected, you felt the connection, and these are your people. And so it's a must for me to travel home every every year. It's like going home. It's just like, you know, you've been on, you've been working, and you've been on vacation or whatever, and then you're going home for vacation. It was a very emotional experience for me. My first time, yes, I was. <laughs> I couldn't, I was trying to fight it and hold it in, but it came out. to you. Uh, means that I'm getting we're getting what we lost our culture back what was taken from us so it's when I do the Eastern blanket dance it's like it means a lot to me because it's like 
from slavery and stuff, we didn't, you know, have that because it was taken from us, it was stolen from us. So when someone came and taught us the dances, it was just beautiful to learn so we have it back. I was excited to be able to be with someone from over there who's like a cousin from 300 years ago and to be around them and to actually have the same type of spirit. That's the thing that amazed me more than anything. Because you can be around people and not feel any kind of connection or feel that they're like you in any way. Because I've been, you know, I've been away to school, so I've been around different people. And, you know, they're nice, and I, but I'm not that totally comfortable. Your, your way is a little different, you know? So, but when you all came here, it was that instant feeling like, yeah, I know these people. One big thing that we've noticed um, when we first made the connection, we saw some similarity between you and us. Uh, it was like looking into a mirror. You know, we look, we were looking, probably like we were looking at our cousins. And um, it was such a beautiful, warm feeling. Um, it was almost as if like, the creator just said, you know what, you are related, you're related to people over here. And you can see it. As soon as you look at it, you can see it. You can feel it. And that was a beautiful thing. Well, you know what I just kept thinking, I mean, this was, this was where my ancestors used to feel comfortable, this is where they live, this is, you know, the place that they grew up. And for me, it's, I feel more of a connection to the people than the place, probably because I, I'm, that kind of uh, scene is like so different for me, the woodlands and all that. But I do feel more closer to the people when I'm there. Because I feel like these are people like their family. They feel like family, they act like family. And strangely enough, like the first time I saw Moonstar, I, I looked at her and I saw her dancing and so on. And I kept saying to everybody that was sitting there, oh my goodness, look at that, she's just like my niece. And then when she came over from Bobby's self, I said, oh my goodness, she is just like my niece. Uh, my reconnections to the tribal people of the New England area was something that I hold very dearly and the experience is something that I don't think many words can express. I mean, more of our people need to keep doing this. You know, and finding out more and more about the history because the history is what, you know, what lets you know why you think the way you do, why, you know, you like what you like, what illnesses you have, and everything. Kizak Namasis, Nin Masapil Wampanak, Kwakwimas, Cedric. What I just said is, uh, good day, my sister, I'm Mashby Wampanak, uh, running bear. My name's Cedric. You know, this is something that they, but it's something I don't want to die out, you know, because it's, it's true to the heart, you know, it's got good morals in it, you know, it's about respect, it's culture. An action means a lot, it means that we, as Indians in Bermuda, right, now have a base. You see in Bermuda, no other group, well, I should say, we are a group that could actually link our roots right to the actual place where we came from. That's why it's so, so uh, important for me to be here. tribe to be able to tell their perspective when we're wrote about in the history books from Europeans perspective is not really how it is. And you have to think we did not even see anything Native American around us to kind of connect it with but it's like Okay, so she's just telling us this, like, yeah, you know, you know, goes back to Jacob Martin, you all are people out there, blah, blah, blah. 
But we're saying, okay, fine, yeah, just take your word for it kind of thing, you know? We go back to the oral history. And that, and, and while other people don't recognize, you know, the, the, the oral history, that was our way of keeping history. It wasn't writing it down on paper or whatever. You know, we would have drew it on the rocks or the cliffs or in caves, our history. You know, or we would have passed it down in our storytelling. <coughs> and storytelling from our elders is as authentic as any English person who writes something down on paper. Even if people don't want to recognize it, but for our people, native people, we recognize our elders and their stories more than something what we read off a piece of paper. Because what they're saying is that the first, the Indians that they actually sent over here, came over here, they were basically the troublemakers. So they found that after they brought them over here, they did not, um, they felt like they had made a mistake. Um, just to read you, because I was reading this article from Bermuda's Pequots, um, the guy Van, Van Eyck Mason, and he wrote that Bermudians possessing both Pequot um, and Mohican slaves cursed the day that they invested in such devilish goods. They actually, in some um, instances, tried to say, um, send the Indians back because they, did, they were rebellious, they didn't want to farm, they said the only time that they were settled and seemed to be um, more contented is when they would have them doing fishing or whaling. Uh, you know, so my, in my family, I have an Uncle David who was a pilot, and there's many in my family who are into fishing, and so that seems to be where uh, the Sinevis Islanders felt comfortable, and even those from Baylor's Bay was in, is, was in fishing. Kip always was reaching out. He always had a fire about his people, and he always told oh, stories. You know, unfortunately, my grandparents and you know, parents talked about Indians and Native American ancestry. And uh, my grandparents never got to see this here. My, my mother did. I bought my mother one year. My grandmother would have really loved this here. And so I'm really traveling for them, for the ancestors that never made it, you know? But why, why do you say your grandmother? Well, my why grandmother- you your ancestors? Well, my grandmother spoke a lot about Native American blood in the family. Um, she was like the forefront of it happening like and she mentioned one time one of these days the Indians are going to come back looking for us. It's really a lost tribe. So I was like, yes, it's a joke and it actually happened that way. actually blessed that the tribes of the Northeastern have or don't see us as family. You know, it's an honor when you see the Mashantucket Pequots uh, line up for grand entry and the Bermudians are uh, invited as family. One of the main prominent ones that was passed off to my grandmother was the story of Dark Bottom. And um, Dark Bottom's area located right below the lighthouse which was the year they were going to not see a thick, thick seed of food. And a small area inside there was carved out for the people's burial and dance on the fire. Similar to this fire in here. And uh, it's something, it's, um, my grandma when she was little, she used to hide in the trees and watch them. And she didn't really manage to speak. And she's, she's always remembered other relatives, other relatives, they took the exact same story. Mm -hmm. uh, but you always knew there was connection, but uh, there was a time when people were talking about the connection because the people were being ridiculed. But it was always there. You yeah. always knew you had it. But uh, being from that place is still uh, it was trauma. Yeah. But that was something that really wasn't celebrated. It was only passed on orally. And after all, some of the stories not getting worse a little bit.
trying to describe her feelings, you know, her feeling of coming home. It was, it was so feeling. strange. And, you know, and I said to her, you know, what do you mean? Because I said, I never had that type of feeling, you know, but she was so intense about this, about the connection, you know, and then it, when she got intense like that, you could, you got fired up too with her, yeah. you know, but she said when she drank from, you know, the water, she, she just felt that, that she was home and that someone, you know, was watching her. So she said she kept looking backwards and she told Stuart, did you feel that? Yeah. Because it was a, like a breeze, breeze. just yeah. blowing over. Yeah. And so Stuart said, yeah, yeah. I, have I did. Yeah. 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 And so she, you know. Yeah. Jean and I, yeah. Tala yeah. took Jean and I up to the place where King Philip was killed. And we drank from the stream. And it was a calm, still day. And Tolog said, if you and Jean would like to say a prayer, you can feel free to do so. So Jean said a prayer, I said a prayer. And the trees, the top of the trees, like someone was up there just shaking the tops of the trees. And I looked at Jean and I, I just felt, you know, yeah. cold chills and you could feel a presence. And I think um, Janet had that same experience in Mashpee. In Mashpee. I've been to Mashpee twice and we we went to um you know the powwow was nice and but um we were shown through the woods a little trail and there was a sacred uh circle i guess where tribal members would would meet and um i don't know the whole experience by sharing with one another, it was just a few of us there, not everybody was there, but that was like the highlight of the whole trip. You gotta go, you just gotta feel it. Yeah. The last <clears throat> powwow, we, Devine and I, my sister stayed with Morningstar. And I used to go out mornings and sit off on the deck, have my coffee, because I love nature. Uh-huh. And I used to hear things up in the trees, right? <laughs> I said no, it's, and see the trees moving, and it sound like a like it's something heavy, you know. And I say so she can't. When the star came, I said, "What kind of animals you got around here?" So she <laughs> said, I'm a "Fox and different things." I said, "No, no, no, no bears." <laughs> I said, "Cause it sounds like a whole lot of bears up in those trees there." <laughs> so she said, "No, no, no." So anyway, we we're sitting there talking, and all of a sudden I heard it again, but she didn't hear it. I said. You didn't hear that? She said, no. I said, look up there, look at the trees moving. She said, see me, I didn't see nothing. So we went on talking again, but that was on my mind. I kept watching up there, right? And it started again. I said, Morningstar, I know you heard that. She said, no, Simi. She said, it's just looking. She said, no. She said, you know what? That's your ancestors. Yeah. I welcome you on the land, you know. Yes. She said because it was just meant for you. Because yes. she did, I kept, you know, I couldn't believe she couldn't hear it. Yeah. Me and many others, we grew up yeah. here. Um, so we have a different story to tell. And even with me, with the first reconnection um, through Earl uh, Colbert, who insisted when I come up that I wasn't to stay at Foxwood, but stay on tribal land. Mm -hmm. In fact, he, he allowed him to stay in his house with uh, my daughter, my youngest daughter and I were the first, when we said the first to arrive then, my wife joined us on the weekend, on the Saturday. And our experience is a lot different than those who came up, even though we came up at the same time, mm -hmm. the same plane. So you know, different experiences. Different experiences. Pequots, and they ended up meeting um, Toluk's son. This is Antoine, Christina's uh, uh, son. She's passed away. Oh, wow. And also, so this was like way back in 1997 when they actually, you know, started research. And even before then, in 19, there's a lot of 1994 with my mom. It's from. Uh, Oh, I forget his name now. Uh, Deerfoot and Lionheart. They came here. This was in 1994. 
and they talked to us about, they came here to do some research and talk to us about the Indian Connection. So even before we started the committee, which was 2002, I was not one of the first members. But, you know, it went way back then when people started to want to find out more about what was our connection overseas. And then I have a picture, I, I, I want to go into my car real quickly and get it. I have an aunt, and um, she had done some research too. That was actually the first time I heard the word Pequot, because she told us that we were Pequot. And this was years and years ago, and she showed us an hour ahead. So I knew, I had heard about it, but didn't really know too much about our connection. But she had mentioned it way back there. Um, I am from St. Louis, and uh, in 2002, my father told us uh, every meeting, and my aunt, Jeannie and Chris Simons, they formed together to sort of a reconnection committee between us, St. Davids, and people from Louisville, um, and some Northeastern tribes in North America, namely the Wampanoags, the Pequots, and the Narragansetts. And from that, we started forming relationships and friendships, and from our very first festival, we decided to come out and say, let's see what your festival was about. Yeah, no, we didn't. We, we always knew we had a Native American connection. And the colonials, colonials looked at us as, called us uh, Mohawks. And then we mean derogatory the things. They looked at us being savage and uncontrollable. Uh, give it a bit of history. St. David's was not physically connected to the main island, the rest of the until the early 1900s. And so they pretty much kept themselves and developed their own culture amongst themselves. And so they always looked at the backwards and the countryside and something like that. And um, they used the word Mohawks as a way of trying to classify as being savage and uncouth as well. But the good thing about it, they recognized the Native American connection. They didn't call us anything else like Aborigine or Bigby. They called us some kind of a connection to a Native American tribe. You've always heard about the St. David's and the Mohawks, but apparently that was more of a derogatory term because most of them were Pequots and Wampanoag, Narragansett. And then of course on the negative side, uh, it, just witnessing how the, the, the rest of the island of Bermuda treated the people from St. David's was deplorable. You know, when I first, the very first time we went there, as you asked, uh, one of the first things I noticed was the moment I left St. David's, and everybody asked, oh, where are you from? I don't know if it was the braids or what. You know, oh, you look like an Indian from the States. Where are you staying? Oh, I'm out in St. David's. Oh, you're out there with the crazy Mohawks. You're out there with the filthy Mohawks. And that just agitated me, you know. That for the longest while, it was always highlighted that we were descendants from Mohawks. Of course, today we know, historically speaking, that's not true. And it's from that background that, for me in particular, um, I've always had a sense of understanding. A large number of the St. David's Islanders tie their connection to the Pequot tribe through a common descendant named Jacob Minor, a man who announced to British colonial administrator John Henry Leaf Roy, Great Britain's governor of Bermuda at the time, that he was a Pequot and that he was captured in the Long Island Sound while fishing. The rest of the St. David's Islanders are all tied into the 80 Pequot families that were captured after the Pequot massacre at Mystic River and the defeat of Sisychus, and were brought to Bermuda to be slaved by a Captain White. Most of the Pequots that were sent to Bermuda were believed to be the ones that were most likely to go against the system again, and was a worry for the safety of the mainlanders, being that they were the wives and children of native warriors. It is even highly believed that Wampano Oaks Atrium Pontigans, King Philip's Queen and Prince was sent there to St. David's after the King Philip War. The Pequots that we were from Jacob Minus, who told the governor Lefroy that he was a Pequot descendant. He was a Pequot descent. And he was a he was a known for piloting. And um, and so you can see, and, and even then, it's written in the history books that um, he looked like he was Native American. Yeah. He had like the high cheekbones and all that. Jacob Miners, how is it that you were, um, how do you make the distinction that Jacob Miners was people? Um, only by what he said. 
That's the only thing that we can go by is what he told the governor that he was of Pequot ancestry. Um, so that's basically it. Yeah, 1791 to 1875, picture of the Jacob Miners. Doing more research, you might find that out that he was part of that group of the 80 Pequots that were uh, bought by Captain White in St. David's. So he more than likely will probably be a part of that group. If this is where he's saying that his uh, ancestry is, is with the Pequots. My great grandfather, uh, my fifth generation great grandfather is Jacob Miner. So. So I'm just a descendant, but I still feel the, the blood flowing in my veins strong, you know? This is my grandfather, this is my mother's father, and that's my mother's mother. And he is a right descendant from Jacob Miners. Jacob Miners, yes. Stuart Miners, and his father was Thaddeus Miners, and Thaddeus' father was Cornelius Miners, and Cornelius Miners was Jacob Miners' son. So it like goes down in sure. family. How how far so, back could be, would you say? Um, 1700, I could go back you to. You could go yeah. back to? Yes. You do everything. You the tie, you could take him to clock, the watch, the nothing. But he could say, no, nah, you've got to get moving because your tide's coming in. I can smell it. Gumbay dances is pretty much when they wear the mask, so you can't see the face and they got the arms and the legs covered up, so you really can't see who they are. But the true story is why they did that because back in the day in Bermuda, you wasn't allowed to, what could I say, celebrate your culture, you know, drum, dance. You, it was considered breaking the law, like you couldn't even gather on the corner and talk to each other. For more than five people, you get locked up, you know. So that's what they done. They put on masks and drums and they ran around the streets and they celebrated and they gave thanks that way. So that's the gumbe dances and that, that's mixed up out of the African and the Native American influence as well.